My name is Ashanti Files, and I am a wife, a mother, a daughter, a sister, a registered nurse, an aunt, and a poet. Very good. My name is Will Rieger, and I am here with Ashanti Files to talk about her role in the community as a poet. Tell us about your journey as a poet. When did you start writing poetry, and, and uh, how has it uh, kind of folded into your life? Wow, it's been a really big part of my life, actually. Um, as an elementary school child, I struggled a lot with anxiety, except it wasn't called anxiety at the time. It was, you know, I have a tummy ache, but there's no medical reason why. And my mom figured it out. She said, you need to write. You need to write what you're feeling. And so she gave me a journal and she gave me a pen. And she said, always write what you're feeling. It's important, you must write. Mm -hmm. And this one was when I was about eight or nine years old. And so, I wrote, um, I had my first like baby journal of poems misplaced. My sisters swear they, that they didn't steal it, hide it, lose it, but I think they did. Um, <laughs> either way, um, I continued to write all through high school. Um, I continued to write through college and was selected as a member of um, the University of Illinois Poetry Slam team. Uh -huh. We placed second in regionals, and then we traveled to Austin, Texas for the national competition, which was just an amazing experience. And then after that, I didn't stop writing, but I stopped performing. Uh -huh. All of those other roles as a wife, as a mother, as a young woman, having a focus on a career and creating this life that I dreamed I would have came first. Uh -huh. And my brother died. Oh. And when my brother died, I turned to writing. And so it was really important for me to transform this hobby into something cathartic. Mm -hmm. This was a process that helped me heal through that trauma. And I thought, oh my gosh, if I can heal, I can share this and maybe other people would heal. And if I could teach it, other people can teach others to heal. So a large part of my poetry is not just for me performing the adrenaline rush. It's about speaking true words that will connect to people. And of course it won't connect with everyone, but to connect with those with a shared experience. And through my writing group, The Writers of Oya, that is funded by a grant through the Urbana Arts and Culture Program. I hope to teach middle school girls this coping mechanism that has literally saved my life. Wow. And so you are seeing your poetry then not only through the slam tradition, but mm -hmm. also through more conventional uh, black mm -hmm. poetry tradition. Absolutely. If you don't mind, I'd like to show you my book. Sure. It's called Woven Perspectives of a Black Woman. And on the cover is my niece and my on the cover is my niece and my daughter. <laughs> and um, the reason that my sister actually took these photos, they're beautiful. Um, the reason that I chose Woven is because I'm thinking, what are we? What am I? I'm a black girl. I'm a black woman. I'm a nurse. I'm an aunt. I'm a mom. I'm a wife. I'm a daughter. You know, and I'm like, I can't be all of these. None of these rhyme. I can't make this into a title. And then I thought of our hair. Black women are constantly manipulating our hair whether it's braiding, twisting, adding, mm -hmm. subtracting, coloring, we're always weaving our hair together, just like we weave together tails. And I hope to have woven together these poems to make an impact. Mm -hmm. So that's why it features hairstyles and little girls getting their hair done because I was their age when I started to write. I was their age when I started to weave. Mm -hmm. And now I'm at a point where I'm still weaving. It's just a different type. So this is the title poem, it's called Woven. And this is a poem that's meant to be read and not necessarily performed. I am woven, I am a woman, created from a multicolored fabric of love and hatred, intent and misinformation, deceit and insecurity, curiosity and a sense of adventure. I am a woman and I am woven like a tattered old blanket. I've been picked up and dropped like a stitch, unimportant, unneeded, and not yet set into a pattern. Tattered and thrown away, forgotten and called ugly, like an ancient tapestry unappreciated by modern youth. I am a woman, and I am woven. I have been ripped open and torn at my core, once adored, used and then left for nothing. 
used to bear life and handed death in return. I gave you my warmth like a tattered old blanket, wrapped you up and smothered you between my thighs with my warmth. I let my love flow like the Nile, let all the while you enjoy the rich and abundant delta of my form. And now I am torn, like a tattered old blanket, picked up and locked away, like a few bucks for a rainy day or until you just feel the need to be embraced. Disgraced and reminded by the patchwork you used to delicately cover the ripped stitches, the holes in the bitches that I have been called by others. I have suffered and I have healed. I have made my case and appeal to the highest authority. A minority, a black diamond, I was once called a gem, but now I am just a hem that is tattered and torn because I am a woman and I was woven, stitched in my mother's belly by a creator who already knew my fate. I shake, yearning for the familiarity of a tattered old blanket where the patchwork hides the drop stitches of a broken life, hides the mistake of a young mother and wife, hides the discolored and multifaceted fabric from which I was born. I am a woman and I am woven. That's lovely. Thank you. I really enjoy the combination that you make. Maybe I could say the weaving mm -hmm. of the physicality and the spirituality. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I write about trying to cope. I write about the feelings of anxiety, and that's another piece I'd love to read for you. Um, sure. If you don't mind. Go right ahead, please. Thank you. This interview is all about you, too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> My sisters won't be surprised at all. <laughs> I'm the oldest. <laughs> this one is titled Pill, and this is a performance piece. I feel my anxiety rise, and it takes all of my strength to survive and then thrive in a world of gray. Or I could separate the night and the day, say it's just one more pill, one more tablet that'll help me feel like a better version of me because who needs to cope with anxiety, feelings to flee from my sweet husband's touch because that spot triggers me and I clutch at my throat and my stomach is suddenly sore, recollections of nights spent on a damp floor, but hey, I could take one more pill, a capsule that'll help me to feel like a better version of me. Just a little more numb and less silly, touchy-feely. I blankly stare at my kids hoping they don't do like mommy did and run, run far, far away, because they couldn't stand the darkness that they face every day by simply looking into a mirror. See that pill? It makes that glass look clearer. I mean, sure, it stifles my creativity, but hell, at least my daughters get to see me and I can smile all day, because that pill took mommy's feelings away, along with mommy's passions and bad dreams. I mean, who needs feelings when we have pills? From tablets and capsules, some Balta, Celebrex, and Paxil. Why feel? Why feel? Why fear? Just take this pill and it all disappears. Behind my toddlers, my eyes searching mine as she asks me if I am happy. I feel my anxiety rise. I'm not naked, but I am afraid to live in a world clouded by gray. Or I could separate the night from the day and take just one more pill. It's very powerful. You think so? Yes. It's, I felt like I was being run over. That's how it feels to have anxiety. You're constantly being run over, except there's nobody to see the truck on top of you. It's all in your head. Mm. Nobody wants to take a pill. Nobody wants that stigma associated with them. And as a black woman, we heavily rely on our culture, on spirituality, on religion, on the church. Mm -hmm. So mental health is something I'm very passionate about. I'm very passionate about, and I'm very open about discussing it. And writing that poem was easy. Performing that poem is very hard for me. Mm -hmm. I always read my audience before I perform that poem um, because you never know how it's going to be received. Right. And in some audiences, I, I make a generalization and say, maybe not this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you the question. Uh, I think a lot about quality, you know, what is good in my work? And maybe that's some example of anxiousness or mm -hmm. uncertainty about myself. But mm -hmm. lately, in the last few years, I've begun to see that I can recognize that quality. How do you judge your poems? I don't. What's good, what's not good? I mean, I guess I do. 
I break it down more into, I'm just going to reposition if you guys don't matter. I break it down more into early work, middle work, and current work. And as I age, I'm sure those categories will shift. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, when I look at those poems I wrote as a kid, and like, roses are red, violets are blue. I'm like, that was awesome for an eight-year-old, you know? I kind of have to hype myself up because, yes, my mom gave me this gift. She told me to write, but it's been up to me to sustain it. So there are times when I say, this is a good poem because it's valid. It's a reflection uh, of my feelings. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily, it's all about me. It's not necessarily meant to connect with everyone. Right. And for the people that it does not connect with, they might not think it's a good poem. But my hope every time I perform, every time I write, is that, that there's that one person in the audience that poem connects to so that they know they're not the only person who thought that, you know? Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> it's really strange, I'm sorry. No, it's not. <laughs> this is my first book, so I'm just kind of winging it. Well, you have this flood, it seems like, and the flood can be steered, it can be, mm. you know, canaled, it can be directed. No one's ever told me that, Will. Yeah? Yeah. You just, well, I'll speak of myself. Mm -hmm. You just find yourself at the page, at the moment it's there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you capture, I think, so much more than if you just wait for the inspiration. Okay. And then try to find the page. Okay. See, this mentorship is starting already. Now, you have, I would say, a very polished, rhyming style. Thank you. How does that work? Do you have to go back and figure out the rhymes yep. or I don't it edit. all comes out that way? Roses are red, violets are blue. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are some poems that I write that have rhyming words, but the way that it's written, it's not, I can't even say that it's not intended to rhyme because it just kind of comes out. Mm -hmm. um, when, you were, when I was little, I was taught poetry rhymes, and I've been blessed through education at universities to have a substantial vocabulary where I can express myself mm -hmm. using a multitude of words that just so happen to rhyme. Mm -hmm. I think it's God's gift. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's talent to it, yes. <laughs> Thank you. One last question. Sure. And you may have already answered this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. It said that you can never really say a poem is done. It's either finished or you abandon it. Mm -hmm. Which do you feel you do? You finish it or do you just walk away from it? I finished it. Okay. My poetry comes from a raw place within me. Mm -hmm. And I write when I'm in those raw spaces to get it out, to control it, as you mentioned it, for validation of those feelings. Right. Because if I can accept if I cannot validate my own feelings, no one else in this world will. Right. So there is no going back and revision because the state of mind I'm in at the revision table is not this that I was in when it poured out of my soul. Right. And it's definitely not abandoned. Okay, yes. very good. Ashanti Files, thank you so much for sharing this log with me. Thank you, <laughs> this is a nice log, isn't it?